Hello everybody. This is a Patreon exclusive review, as I've mentioned on my previous review, because the subject matter, so, you know, be prepared. Because today we're talking about a Stephen King book, which, this is the, like, when I got my last big dump of books here, it was the first time I've ever seen a copy of this. And I've had, like, I had no idea what this was going to be like getting into it. I've heard a little bit about it. But I've never seen a single review for, like, the Netflix series or anything. I've stayed away because I know I was going to read it one day. It is Gerald's Game. Which comes with a wonderful picture of Stephen King. I swear it's, like, the only picture of him they have most of the time. It's kind of eerie when you, you know, set, you know, you're reading and you set the book down because you're at lunch or something and you see this staring up at you. But, as you do. Since there's no description on the back of the cover, I didn't expect just how dark this book was actually going to get. All I knew about the story was there's a woman handcuffed to a bed. That's it. Which, I mean, that is kind of the gist of it. But let's talk a bit more in depth on this. Jessica and her husband, Gerald, go out to their lakeside cabin to, you know, they've been experimenting a bit with, like, you know, like, you know, using restraints during sex and all that. And, well, how to put it, it doesn't go well. She hasn't really been, you know, enjoying it that much over the last few years, or the last few sessions. Their relationship in terms of years also hasn't been great, honestly. And, well, she doesn't want to go through with it this time. Like, she's handcuffed to the bed, and she has, like, last minute has her doubts. But Gerald doesn't see it. In fact, he thinks she's joking. So when he does actually try to move on her, she kicks him, and as a result, he has a heart attack. Now, to be fair, he wasn't that healthy. He smoked, he drank, he's overweight. So there's that. But this has left Jessica in a very bad situation where she's handcuffed to the bed, she can't really move her arms any more than like this, for what it's worth. And she has no way of getting help. After all, they're in the middle of nowhere, and the only thing she can hear outside are a loon, a dog, and the distant sound of a chainsaw. That's it. So it kind of puts her in a bit of an awkward situation, to say the least. And that's when the story starts getting really interesting. You see, in her head, there's these voices talking to her that are kind of why this happens. Because a new voice springs up, which she recognizes as the voice of her friend Ruth. Who just kind of, you know, doesn't really mess around. It puts things very bluntly and is very harsh on her. Of course, there's Goody, the uh, perfect little wife voice, which just tells her, you know, tries to guide her on what it thinks is right and is very old-fashioned how women were supposed to be in, like, the 50s. And those are the main two early on. There's also just random ones that drift in and out, and other ones that get added in as the story goes on, because she ends up spending a lot of time in her own head. And there are most of the dialogue out of this comes from. The story is a little... It's kind of hard to describe it as this, because it's kind of a big character study, but there's definitely more to it than just a character study. You know, it's... There's stuff going on, but it delves a lot into the background of this woman, what she's been through, and just how it all ties in. And how she has to get over her demons of the past, and also to learn from things from her past to get through what she's in now. This also ties in with the story of Doris Cl Dolores Claiborne, which I have read. I don't know if I'm going to review it, just because it's, it's a good story. It's just a really hard story to talk about because the way it's written. This one's definitely more on par with regular Stephen King writing, at least. Most of the big tropes we think of when we think Stephen King are not in this book. Neither are they in Dolores Claiborne, which is very interesting. These are two very different works of his. And the way they tie it together has to do with the solar eclipse. 
it doesn't really add that much to the story. It's just kind of a thing in it. So, you know, as you do. But the solar eclipse is part of her, Jessica's very traumatic childhood. Well, I say very because to her it is, until she starts realizing that, uh, well, it could have been a lot worse. I don't want to go into, in way too into depth with what was going on with this, just because it's not pleasant to talk about what it goes into depth on here. And there's a lot more going on in the story, too. Like, the stuff in her background that takes up most of the middle of the book. And it's something that you have to read through it, and you know what's going to happen. You can tell that, you know, something bad is happening. It builds up really good. There's a lot of tension. But when it, what actually ends up happening is it just terrible as it leads up to be. You think it's going to be a lot worse. It's just kind of like, oh, it's done. And, yeah. And I think that's why part of the story is just, her having this moment of it could have been a lot worse she needs there's some lesson she needs to learn from this there's also stuff going on physically around her outside of her head which is very important one of the main things being the dog they mentioned barking earlier in the book she's a stray dog who actually has his own storyline going on here which is pretty neat that wanders into the cabin and starts eating gerald Yeah. It's described in fairly rich detail, as are a lot of things that happen in this story. But you do feel bad for the dog, all things considered. I don't feel bad for Gerald. I mean, the guy, everything we learn of him, he's just not that interesting to me. Well then, let's talk about... One of the other major things in the story, and it's kind of a spoilers thing, so I don't really want to bring this up, but I don't want to talk too much about the stuff that goes on with her childhood, because it is really dark. And I don't want to talk about how she gets out of the handcuffs, because not only is it a huge spoiler, it's one of the few things I've ever read that made me want to throw up. For the entirety of the sequence, I was reading my... I'm eating my lunch and I'm reading this, and I do all my reading at work. And, of course, it comes to, like, the most disturbing and disgusting thing that I ever think Stephen King's written. It's just nasty, and it really puts me off watching the Netflix movie. Well, that among, you know, the eclipse and all that, but... I will actually probably end up watching the Netflix movie. Just out of curiosity, it also... I do think this would be a story my boyfriend would find interesting, but I doubt I'm going to get him to read the book. So there's that. If I think the movie's worth reviewing, I'll talk about it. But one of the big things that happens, that it's uncertain if it's like a physical thing going on, or if it's just in her head, is that Jessica starts seeing this strange figure in the bedroom at night. This thing is just standing in the corner, watching her. It doesn't look quite right, like the forehead drawn, the lips stick out, way too much. And the arms are, like, overly long. And it's carrying this bag filled with bones and jewelry. And she assumes that it's the figure of death. Kind of. It could have easily been. But, yeah, it gets... Again, I'm not going to spoil too much about it. It's just a very strange thing. And the way it's described, there's a lot of really genuinely good horror in this. And I think a lot of the horror does actually come specifically from these scenes, where we don't really know if what's going on is physical, if it's in her mind, if it's in her mind, how does it relate to the other stuff she's going through mentally right now. And the fact that the dog reacts to it as well, like the dog avoids whatever this thing is, says a lot about what's actually going on here. Again, not spoiling it, so... And I really didn't guess where they were going with that particular plot element. I did kind of guess that the dog barking outside of the house would tie into what's going on in the story. Same, I was also thinking the chainsaw might, but that, I don't know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil it, but it's not super important to the story. So there's that. I'm trying to think what else there really is to say about Gerald's game. It's very well written. The stuff it handles is definitely for a much more mature audience. Like, this isn't a Stephen King book you, you'd read in high school. 
I guess I could say it's a better description of BDSM than anything they do in Fifty Shades, from what I understand, of those books. Sure, it's not a healthy relationship, but they blatantly state that, and how at one point it was, and it's gone downhill. Also, I guess, you know, the importance of consent. If he would have just unlocked her handcuffs, this wouldn't have happened. So there's that. I don't really think there's anything else major I want to say about this. I don't really want to spoil a lot of the book, because considering how old a lot of the works of Stephen King are by this point, like we're talking, you know, like 80s, 90s, before I was born, it's really nice being able to read one of these things with only a vague bit of knowledge about it. They do tell about the dog eating her husband. You kind of see coming when they start talking about the backstory of the dog. And there's a dead guy involved. You know there's somebody getting chewed on. When the voices in her head start talking, like it's right in the first chapter, the death of her husband's in the first chapter. So I don't really think I've spoiled too much of this. Like, if you're prepared for how nasty this is going to get at times, I definitely advise reading this. However, unlike a lot of other works of by Stephen King, I don't recommend this for the faint of heart. A lot of his stuff, like Pet Cemetery, Christine, it's really not scary. They're scary concepts, but when you're actually reading it, just kind of like, meh. This is. This is a way too realistic scenario in a lot of ways. Which, the same can be said for Dolores Claiborne. I would actually read that first, because it gives a little hint of what's going to happen in the story. Just a little. Just a little. And it's also just kind of a nice piece to go along with it, since they both have some similar points where there's similar stuff happening. It's not the exact same at all. Like, there's a lot of differences. But you can see little overlaps in the lives of the characters, just little ones, where stuff kind of makes a bit more sense. I will eventually, of course, continue reviewing through the Sky O'Malley books. Might take me a little bit, but, you know, I have to have time to do the reviews, so that's most of what it works out, too, is I don't have a ton of time to do this kind of thing. Beyond that, there's, of course, the book I'm reading currently is another one by Beatrice Small, but I think that one will actually be a YouTube review, so there's that. And I'm going to be going to the States for ten days, so there will be a gap with just nothing going on, just for everybody's information. At least everybody who watches this on Patreon. But other than that, you know, I think that'll do it for this review. If I do end up watching the movie and feel it's worth talking about, I will definitely discuss it on here. I might let the human do it, but it's nice getting to talk about Stephen King, and he's done a lot of stuff, and I've read like 75% of it, so who knows? Maybe the next review will just be a Stephen King one, because I don't even need to read half of the stuff to review it anymore. See you next time.